We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode. We're up to 143, Bob, now. Oh, gosh, heading towards, uh, blimey, I don't know how many years we've been doing, but we'll soon be heading up to 150. Yeah. It's not so far off. Well, yeah, that's it. It'll be nearly three years. (gasps) Shocking. And the episode that we're doing today is the importance of continuity and predictability in the therapy process. I often say this when I start these podcasts. What a wonderful title. And I'm saying it again. But then I then what happens in my head, I think, well, as I thought most of these topics up, I must be pretty narcissistic. But this <laughs> It's very true though, Bob. They are wonderful titles. <laughs> At the same time, uh, my wife listening would say I am pretty narcissistic. But anyway, let's let's go on to this. Continuity and predictability. Yes. Yeah. Well, without them. Jackie, I don't think effective psychotherapy will help. Say more, Bob. Well, you know, with continuity and predictability, they're the corners, they're the cornerstones, and you know, of a safe, secure, protective psychotherapy. You know, um, and without continuity, predictability without safety, without security, effective therapy will not happen. I think it's really interesting that you're saying that because in the last episode, if people haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it. But we were talking about <clears throat> sometimes therapy, we we can't predict how it will go. No, I didn't mean predictability in the sense of what's going to happen in the next session. I don't mean that type of predictability. I meant the predictability for the client that that, that, that they know that the the, the client's done a... Sorry, the therapist is going to turn up. The therapist is going to be late. Right, so we're talking about the actual structure of a session and that we're the same person week in, week out and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And that type of predictability leads to a stable other absolutely yeah quite often security and all that stuff yeah yeah Yeah. quite often for the clients they've had an unpredictable history in the sense that their caretakers or significant other people have not been a stable other at all yeah there's something about this in in my early days that i can remember i felt quite uncomfortable with because (laughs) I wasn't very good at having firm boundaries. I I was a people pleaser. I still am to a certain extent. But I needed to learn to be more, I want to say strict, but maybe that's the wrong word. You know, if, if somebody turned up late and tried to extend the time that I would say, you know, with, without being very blunt, you know, time's up. And, and, keeping firm boundaries as as a predictable therapist i found quite difficult in the early stages yeah but and while you're talking i'm sure you got trained this way the essentiality of that yeah absolutely oh yeah because nearly all the clients well let's not say nearly but the majority of the clients you'll meet and i will meet and a lot of the therapists listening will meet have been weird on Boundaries which are unstable and unpredictable. Yeah. And therefore the client growing up doesn't know, didn't know where they were. Yeah. Didn't know what to expect. Yeah. And certainly there's no stability in the whole process. Yeah. So structured firm boundaries are really important uh, in the development of a healthy um, upbringing. Yeah. And, and sometimes they'll challenge that. Of course. Well, that, that's what adolescence is about. I mean, so, yeah. you know, the problem is when somebody walks in and said they've never, have an, they've never had an adolescence. Now, when somebody says that, 
you know there's been problems because that means they've adapted and complied to such a sense they've lost sense of themselves yeah and the therapy then is usually about helping them have a later adolescence where they can say no yeah where they can do you know uh, develop a sense of autonomy where they can develop and know who they are and create an identity and uh, ownership of that identity rather than adapt to the caretaker or parent or significant others um view of what that identity should be yeah so we need to be quite robust and resilient in the therapy room then if we're going to be challenged by adolescents in there <laughs> yeah you see I, I think it's really very important i think but just getting back to the word the, what you said i think even though you may have felt and this might have come from your fostering um, background and being a you know foster parent and everything even if you even if you felt you know unkind strict or whatever it was when you were keeping those boundaries I would say to you back to you that's essential mm. healthy parenting even if you felt x yes yeah see I don't think it's being strict I think it's being the healthy firm parent um helping creating predictability continuity and structure that is so important for psychological health yes yeah even if <clears throat> they don't always appreciate it at the time <laughs> Well, you see, people we've seen usually come from a place where they haven't had that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, um, they they don't appreciate it because they haven't had it. Mm. But once they start, you know, understanding the importance of boundaries and predictability and stability and everything else that goes with that, you have a different process. Yeah, yeah. But... If you think of think developmentally, therapists will work with the younger self, you know, many different three, four, five, six, they might work nine, ten, eleven. If we're going to adolescence, usually you probably uh, have done the younger work before you get to the adolescence, but you might do the adolescent trauma or uh, whatever relation needs to get down to the younger self. Usually, though, you go to the younger self and work back upwards. But I know many therapists who are wonderful at working with the younger um, child of three, four, five, six, seven, but aren't so wonderful at working at the adolescent stage. I know many people as well are wonderful working at the adolescent stage, but aren't so perhaps wonderful working with the real younger infant now if you find a therapist that can do both you're onto a winner yeah i was much better working with people the younger infant i wasn't so i thought it was not bad but uh, i don't think i had the same type of uh effectiveness perhaps working with adolescents and that's mainly because um, of the terrible, the, the, the hit, my own history. See, do, even as you were saying that, I was thinking, what, what would I say? And I think I'm probably the opposite. I think I probably work better with somebody in their adolescence than younger. Mm. I can I can connect with it better. No, I'm the reverse. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't mean you couldn't do both. Doesn't mean I couldn't do both. But I know that I can connect and uh, perhaps work more effectively. If you want to use that language, apart, I think there might be more potent language with the younger, younger, tall, mind, higher self than perhaps the adolescent self. And that could be that I haven't done enough work with the trauma of my adolescent self. There could be many reasons, but I know it will be to do with my history, the way I'm talking. Yeah. yeah, and I think we've we've got to respect that in ourselves as well, that we 
prefer to to work in certain ways with certain people that that's that's okay yeah my daughter who always swore growing up she would never be a psychotherapist i mean she used to say well you know i was brought up by two psychotherapists so i'm not going to be doing that and she went off to university to study in film interestingly enough she decided she didn't want to do that and now she, then she went on to another university and uh studied um you know what was it called Med, Med, i can't remember the title of it but it was in, in the area of mental health and uh, what does she do now she is a mentor working with adolescents and um, adolescents with behavioural problems in schools and she will talk to me how much she loves working with adolescents and particularly adolescents that have had have you know I don't know negative behavioural problems if you want to put it that way yeah now I know that I would not be effective with that population at all so that's really interesting isn't it that she if you think of my script, think of her script, and that I'm the parent of her, and she's passionately, passionately now involved in working with adolescents and helping them develop a much more healthy sense of being rather than those negative. But she's no interest in working with the younger traumatized self. Yeah. There's a story in there somewhere, Bob. <laughs> yeah, too much for this podcast, and I'll perhaps I'll think about it later myself. But it's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I like it because it chal it's challenging. I I feel like I can be challenging in the therapy room. Mm. Mm. You know, if they're not being what I think is authentic, I can I can challenge them on it and they'll come back with something and it opens up a whole area of discussion. If I had to guess the difference, that you had a more secure parent in your history than me, probably. Now, if I look at Jessica, I, I think I did a good job with Jessica, and she's got a secure parent and able to be able to set the boundaries in a healthy way with an adolescent from a mother and from me. In my history, I didn't have that type of secure parent that I gave to my own daughter. Yeah. Does See, that make I... sense? absolutely but i potentially look at it another way that i i didn't feel like i had the emotional connection to my parent when i was younger okay okay so it's it's that emotional empathic side of me potentially that isn't the best <laughs> that i think you might need when you're working with the younger self yeah that's Whereas, where I'm yeah. with the adolescent they're a bit more robust i think it's forces for courses it's really interesting yeah but i do know continuity predictability leads to a stable other and that's for a healthy process and healthy psychotherapy that's what our clients need they don't need a therapist that they see as unpredictable yeah won't be there for them yes and a continual supporting other and one they see uh, and they don't need the therapist they see as unstable yeah yeah that's absolutely certain if those if they see their therapist as unstable letting them down hasn't got a sense of continue uh, continuity when things get tough they'll actually be repeating history mm. and if i was a supervisor I will tell that client to leave their therapist. Oh, but basically I'll tell the therapist to have their own therapy first. Uh, but what I'm really saying is the client needs another type of therapist because client, you know, for a healthy process and effective psychotherapy, you need to depend on the therapist. You need to see them there in a healthy, continuing way. You need to have a sense of, uh, that the client's predictable and on their side. Yeah. As you will repeat history. Yeah. Yeah. Way. Yeah. And it, it, again, I suppose it, it's what the client sees as being predictable. Oh. You know, and what what they want from us, and that that goes back, I think, to the relationship that you have with the client, which mm. is 
paramount to everything. Absolutely. but And if you're going to make that relationship secure and safe as much as you can, you need to be there for them. Yeah. You need to be predictable in that caring, kind attitude, that supportive other, someone that's on their side. And that promotes what we're talking and promotes a safe harbour yeah. in the relationship. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they can literally come and tell you anything and everything and there's no fear of judgment or repercussions or or anything like that, yeah. yeah they feel held, there's a sense of containment. Yeah. That's why these conditions for a therapist are so important, the therapy to foster. Yeah. Yeah, it's a wonderful space. Well, that's what I hope we do. Yeah, yeah, me too. I've had people say, you know, friends and relatives, I suppose, say to me, is this what it's like in therapy? And I'm like, no, this is nothing like what it's like in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> this is not me being a therapist. Um, yeah, people, I, if unless people have been to therapy, I think they assume what it's like. But I, do, I don't think there's any other space like, the therapy room outside of the therapy room not in the sense of the developmental work that we do and the um dealing with deficits and repetitive trauma um i agree yeah yeah because i'm not very predictable or um you know, good at continuity outside of the therapy room, I don't think, in my personal life, yeah. I think as a therapist, we need to carry through certain attitudes and certain ways of thinking. And all the things we're thinking about here is in the surface of creating an environment that they didn't have or couldn't even dream of having. So you'll get a reparative process going on. Yeah. Yeah. So, Bob, that was another good session. Yeah, I enjoyed it. And uh, I know I've got a couple of weeks or so off now because I'm going away on holiday. And I was just thinking predictability and continuity. One thing that is in, in the other sense of predictability is I do enjoy my holidays. And it leads on what we talk most of all about, which is self care for the therapist. Yes, which is vitally That's important. Really important to model. Yeah, I'm actually going away for the first time ever um, on a, a retreat in a couple of weeks, actually. Yeah, in fact, I I need to check up well, on the dates. It I'll, might play, I'll talk to you about retreats. Yeah, we, we need... You know, you know I've been on many, 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 many retreats. Yes. For the last 12 years. And in fact, the, the retreat I go to twice a year is ending in March next year after 12 years. So I'll happily talk to you off air about retreats. Talk about continuity and predictability. Mine's in Anglesey, Bob. That's where I'm going for mine. Well, I I was born in Wales. I was born in Brecon. Yeah? Yeah. One place and uh, I've been to a lot is uh, the Brecon Beacons and Carnarvon and uh, many different places down a lot in Wales and Port Maddock and the retreat, one of the retreats was always seven miles from Port Maddock um, so Wales is in my heart I lived in Wales for two years it's, both my kids are fluent in, in Wales, not me so what we're going to be doing over the next couple of um, podcasts Bob, which I have absolutely no idea what the content of either one of these are <laughs> there's a surprise well, I gave you a list of loads. I mean, one of the things I was talking about off air again uh, was about sequences of psychotherapy and how there's a beginning of that end. Actually, um, I've got a marvelous book up here called Sequences of Psychotherapy, and the sequences that therapists tend to follow through uh, for an effective psychotherapy. I mean, that's an interesting podcast. Um, I, I can think of top lot of but i know you've got a lot of these titles well so what you... i've got written down in my little book that i have is the pinocchio effect and the cinderella effect right so 
my other one can go later because both of those are fabulous. I have no idea what that is all about, Bob. So Do I will you? learn something new. <laughs> I'm presuming the Pinocchio. Well, I don't know what. It, I no, I have no idea. I've just been guessing. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll see you in the next podcast. Okay, don't Bob. Thank you, and enjoy your holiday. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.